Okay, so today we're going to talk about memory uh, and uh, well, this might or might not work depending on if I turn it on or not. Okay, so there are there are three processes of memory. Uh, the, these processes are called encoding, storage, and retrieval. This is also called the information processing approach for memory. And just like the mirror neurons that I told you about a moment ago, the mirror neurons and information processing are both going to be on your final. So I don't tend to call it the information processing approach, but that's what it is. And what it means is that we have these three uh, processes of memory, encoding, which means putting something into a form that can be stored in memory, storage, which means keeping information in memory, and then retrieval, which means bringing information back up from memory. And you will see, we will talk a little bit more about all of these as well. So there are three types of memory, uh, subdivisions of memory. They are called uh, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. And the first thing we're going to talk about is sensory memory. All sensory input goes into your sensory memory. So when you're... Um, Sensory memory would not be what a lay person considers memory. A lay person is a non-professional, right? So you will know what that it's a part of memory, but it's not what you probably think of as memory at this point. So we're going to talk about what it is and what are its characteristics and how memory loss occurs in these memory systems. So uh, what is sensory memory? Sensory memory is your sense organs ability to keep information in that sense for a very, very short period of time. And I mean short, okay? So the, it only lasts for a split second, but everything that goes, that goes into your senses goes into sensory memory. So everything that gets in your eye, everything that gets in, goes through your ear, skin and so forth and when you pay attention to something in sensory memory it's automatically placed into short-term memory so um, what are the characteristics the characteristics are that it has a very limited what we call duration which means how long the information will be in there very limited anywhere from a point a, so in other words point one or in other words a tenth of a second all the way up to two seconds, which is for hearing. And a large amount of information can be stored in sensory memory. It's a near perfect image or a near perfect sound. And uh, what I want you to do right now is close your eyes. So if everybody would just close your eyes. And I want you to think about the people that came into this class. And I want you to think about the people around you. As you looked around the classroom, what people are wearing has burned into your retina, but it only stayed there for a half a second or so, okay? Can you remember what people around you were wearing? Can you remember what they were wearing? Anybody? Colors. You remember the colors? Okay, good. You can open your eyes. So basically what the deal is, is that now everybody's looking around to see if they were right. How many of you were right? Good, okay, so some of you, it got your attention and it went into your short-term memory. However, and possibly your long-term memory, but it for sure into your long-term memory if you're remembering it now. But the thing is that that most everything goes, well, everything goes into our sensory memory and almost every single thing gets, just leaves that memory. So everything goes in, Nothing goes any further unless you pay attention to it, okay? So uh, how does memory loss occur in this type of memory? There's two processes that work. One of them is called decay, and the other one is called displacement. So everything goes into sensory memory and either gets your attention and goes into short term, or it, it decays over the passing of time. So after a couple of seconds, what you've heard fades away, after a half a second, what you saw fades away. That's decay, the fading away or passing of the information. Displacement, on the other hand, could also happen. Before it gets a chance to become displaced or fade away, 
you have new sensory input <coughs> that's coming in and replacing what was in your sensory memory. So you, you have um, an, another vision, okay? Something else comes into your visual field or you hear a, a something else or whatever. All right, so here's a review diagram of sensory memory. All sensory input goes into sensory memory where it lasts anywhere from a tenth of a second to two seconds and, and its capacity or detail is large. If it gets your attention, it automatically goes to short term. Otherwise, it's lost through fading away after this duration, which is decay, or new information comes in and takes its place, which is um, displacement. All right, so short-term memory is whatever you're paying to attention to right now. Anything that currently has your attention is in your short-term memory. talk about the same things. What is it? What are its characteristics? <coughs> how does memory of loss occur? And also how we can improve it. So short-term memory is also called working memory because it's whatever you're working on right now. So this is an immediate memory for in information that you momentarily hold in your consciousness like a phone number that you're trying to use. And anything that has our attention uh, is in our short-term memory. So if you're thinking about it, listening to it, somebody talk about it, speaking, reading, writing, or daydreaming about it, any of these things, anything that has your current attention, you would, would be in your short-term memory. And what are the characteristics? Well, there is a limited duration to short-term memory, uh, about 20 to 30 seconds, and a limited amount of information that fits in there, about five to nine bits, which is what we call pieces of information. In short, and when we're talking about memory, we call them bits. And most people prefer to keep the information in short-term memory as an auditory stimuli. So in other words, we, per we prefer to hear things in order to keep them in our head for a short period of time than to see them or anything else, feel them or whatever. So the duration means how long something stays in the memory system, like I said before. And for short-term memory, that ranges between 20 and 30 seconds. So you already know that we can extend that duration of short-term memory, and I will um, show you that in a moment. So the capacity, like I said, is five to nine bits of information, so an average of about seven bits. And you also know that we can increase that capacity. For example, you can remember a 10-digit phone number uh, for a moment there. Uh, even though it's beyond the, the regular five to nine. And so we're going to talk about how that happens. All right, so how does memory loss occur in short-term memory? Same two processes, decay and displacement. Decay means that it fades away after the 20 or 30 second interval that it usually stays in our memory. And then displacement means that when our attention shifts, uh, the information in our short-term memory is replaced. So it, uh, this is called um, displacement, and it basically means that new information comes in and takes the place of what we were paying attention to. So in other words, we pay attention to something else. So how do we improve short-term memory? Well, one thing we can do is we can try to extend the duration of short-term memory through rehearsal. Rehearsal means that we continue to work with the information. Now, it, uh, to prevent it from fading or, or from prevent it from uh, decaying, okay? And basically, as long as we are attending to it in some way, the information can stay in there. So we extend the duration through rehearsal. We keep thinking about it, we keep saying it to ourselves, we keep writing it, whatever. And then we can also increase the capacity of short-term memory through a process called chunking. Chunking means grouping things together, and it's especially important if the groups are meaningful. So for example, I can, uh, if you have a phone number that you want to remember, you don't just remember it by trying to remember 10 separate digits, right? Instead, you chunk it into the area code, the exchange, and then the last four digits. So I remember my, my phone number at work, 713-718-5816.
or even 58, 16. If 58 already means a 5 and an 8 in that order, 16 is one thing you're remembering, but it means a 1 and a 6 in that order. You see what I mean? So chunking it this way makes us be able to remember more. Here's another example. All right, so here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 bits of information. That's way too much for you to remember. Uh, so if you try to remember a chunk this way, it helps, but it's not great. But if you chunk it into something meaningful, NFL, IRS, DVD, CBS, okay? If you do that, can you remember those four? Absolutely. So you're remembering 12 bits, which is way more than you're supposed to, but you've chunked it in a meaningful way, so it's very easy to remember. You with me? That's the advantage of chunking. What it does is it increases the capacity of short-term memory. Okay, so how do you prevent displacement? Well, you block it, you know, you block things out. You don't want to pay attention to anything else, so you try to to block out other things while you're trying to, re let's say you're trying to remember this phone number, you're trying to keep it with you, you know? So you're concentrating on the information to prevent anything else from getting your attention. So here's the review diagram for short-term memory. So remember that in sensory memory over here, anything that got our attention went into short-term memory, okay? And um, in short-term memory, it's gonna stay for 20 or 30 seconds or longer if we continue to work with it or rehearse it. And the capacity is five to nine bits, but we can make we can extend that by chunking it, by putting it into groupings, meaningful ones if we can, uh, and that will increase how much stuff we can hold. So some of the stuff in short-term memory will be transferred to long-term memory. Other stuff will be lost through decay or displacement. Decay, it fades away in 20 or 30 seconds, Displacement, our atten attention uh, shifts. So how do things get go into long-term memory? We're not quite sure, okay? We know that some things go in there, things that are emotional are more likely to go in there, things that are about you, personal, are more likely to go in there. But sometimes it seems like you have to try to put something in long-term memory, like you have to make an effort to say, I'm gonna remember this, okay? So. This is the example, and once again, I get to teach you something you already know. So um, the example is that you and Joe are driving around, and you want to call Mary and invite her to dinner. So you don't have her phone number, and you stop at a convenience store to use their phone number, their phone book, excuse me. The clerk hands you the book, you look up Mary's name, and you see the phone number. You see it visually, right? Now, what are you doing with the phone number as you walk out of the store to go to, the, to get a phone? What are you doing with the number? Repeating it. Repeating it. Okay. And what is that called? It's called what? No, it's not called chunking. It's called what? Rehearsal. Rehearsal. So you're rehearsing it. You, um, one of the things that you've done is that you've transferred a visual stimulus into an auditory one. So the first thing y'all said is you're repeating it, right? Well, think about that. You saw the number, but you're not picturing it all the way out to your car or to another, a phone booth or wherever you're using. So instead, you've transferred it into an auditory stimulus because most people prefer to keep things in short-term memory by what they sound like. So you already know that the information is best kept in short-term memory by hearing it, okay? Then you said that you're, uh, uh, that, well, you didn't say this, but you're probably chunking the number, right? You did, uh, somebody did, I don't know. Anyway, so you're chunking the number, which means you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh. So you're putting it in chunks of the, of the area code, the exchange, and the last four digits, because you know that if you chunk it, it'll increase your capacity. So you can remember 10 digits, even though normally we only remember about seven. All right, and as you walk out of the store, why are you repeating the number over and over? Huh? To avoid what? Fading. Fading. Decay. 
the fate of decay, right. So what you already know is that you're repeating it because otherwise it'll fade away in 20 or 30 seconds. So you already know that rehearsal it increases the limited duration of short-term memory and prevents decay, okay? Now, uh, as you get to the car, Joe, if you're over there, you're just going 713 718 5816. And Joe's like, hey, was she listed? Did you get the number? Did you buy me my hot Cheetos? And you're like, 713 718 5816, right? The reason you're doing that is to avoid what? Distraction. Not distraction. What's the, what's the word? Displacement. Displacement. Displacement, right. So, probably are waving Joe's questions off and shaking your head and saying the number louder and trying to concentrate how harder on that number because you, are, you already know that if you <coughs> shift your attention to Joe's questions the phone number will be displaced see so everything I taught you so far about short-term memory you already know right you know that it's limited duration and so you have to repeat it or rehearse it you know that it's a limited capacity hook so you have to chunk it you know that um, that, um, that to avoid it being displaced, you um, you have to pay attention to it, right? All right. So remember what you saw a picture of early on in this presentation. What did y'all see a picture of that didn't seem to fit with the presentation? I saw y'all see a heart. it. A heart. What did it say? What? It said have a heart. So how many of you remember seeing that? Okay, so um, if you remember it, are you using your short-term memory? Yeah. No. no, why not? Long-term because it was more than 20 or 30 seconds. That's right, it's long-term for two reasons. That's what you saw, by the way. Okay, or you should have seen it. Uh, and if you paid attention to anything else between the time that, I, that the heart showed up and everything we did, which you did because you were interacting with me. So obviously, if you pay attention to anything else, that heart uh, should have been displaced, right? And it's been more than 20 or 30 seconds, should it, so it could have decayed. So basically, it's not short-term memory. You were using your long-term memory, okay? So long-term memory is memory for facts and skills and habits. And uh, we're going to talk about all the same things. What is long-term memory? It's a vast store of information that we store until it's called to memory. So we have to call it back to our short-term memory. We don't. We have a bunch of stuff right now in our in our long-term memory, but we only know, as in we can only discuss uh, or remember whatever we're able to bring back to our short-term memory. So there are divisions of long-term memory, uh, explicit, that's also called declarative, and implicit, which is also called procedural. I explicit or declarative memory is memory for facts. And those are, there are two different kinds of explicit or declarative memory. Semantic uh, memory, which is memory for general facts that anybody can know, and episodic memory, which is memory for personal facts about you that other people might not know. And then implicit or procedural memory is memory for skills and habits and the involuntary responses we learn through classical conditioning. The characteristics of, of long-term memory. Uh, the, the information stays in long-term memory for an unlimited period of time. It can be minutes or a lifetime. So you remember that heart and minutes had gone by. Uh, some of you might be on your deathbed and remember that damn heart. So you just never know how long it's gonna last. An unlimited amount of information can be stored in long-term memory. So you have no limits to what you can put in there. And the most common way to keep information in long-term memory is by its meaning not by how it sounds, not word for word, but by what it means. So um, how long does it last? Anywhere from minutes to a lifetime. Information may be lost, but it doesn't have to be lost. So we don't think of decay as having to happen. Decay doesn't have to happen, it can, but it need not. The capacity is uh, 
how much information, and like I said, it's an unlimited amount. How does memory loss occur in long-term memory? Well, here's the problem. We got five, five different methods, I believe it is, five or six. So it's not just decay and displacement anymore, okay? Remember, decay doesn't even have to happen. So the first thing that can happen to lose memory in long-term memory is called a consolidation failure. So let me tell you what consolidation is. Consolidation is the physical process of making a new memory. <coughs> The dendrites grow to make new synaptic connections, and that is the, the part of the brain responsible for that is the hippocampus. So we actually make new memories because the hippocampus has us making new synapses through the process of dendrites growing, and that's called consolidation. A consolidation failure might occur when, for example, um, we pass out or something like that, um, and so when, if we pass out, have a seizure, have a stroke, something like that, then when we come to, we might not remember what just happened simply because um, the, um, sorry, simply because um, we didn't physically make a memory because our brains weren't, were not working correctly. All right, so another thing that can happen is an encoding failure. An encoding failure is, a, encoding is the process of putting something into memory. And an encoding failure occurs when you don't actually try to remember something. Remember when I had you draw a penny, right? When I had you draw a penny, most of you didn't remember the details. The reason is that even though you've seen a penny many times, you haven't attempted to encode the information on the penny. So you haven't sat there and said, okay, I'm gonna really look at this and I'm gonna remember what you know what's on the penny and what where it's it is on the penny. So a lot of times we might be reading something and we're not trying to remember what we read and it doesn't go in. It doesn't go into long term memory because we're just going through the process of reading without realizing, hey, I'm not I'm not taking this in. Alright. Uh, Motivated forgetting is another type way of losing information in long-term memory. Uh, this means that we forget something because we have a psychological motive. Now that, that doesn't mean we forget on purpose. On, on the contrary, we forget and we don't realize that, uh, that something happened at all. So it can be uh, something minor, like forgetting that you have, a, you have to go to the dentist today to have a root canal. Well, nobody likes to have a root canal, right? So basically what happens is that you might forget. You knew yesterday, you thought about it this morning, and when your appointment time comes up at two o'clock this afternoon, you completely space it, okay? That's motivated forgetting, because who wants to go to the dentist, right? All right, then it could also be forgetting a major stressful life event, like having been abused or molested, especially things that happened in childhood are more likely to get um, to get uh, what we call repressed or forgotten because uh, th th there was a psychological motive. As an adult, for example, if you're unfortunate enough to survive a rape, or I guess it's not not the survival part, but to have been victim of a rape, then um, you probably won't forget it. But in childhood, you may have been molested, and you forget. Some of that is because. A child has no other options, right? What am I going to do? An adult has more options. So as a child, you may feel like you can't tell anybody or something like that, and uh, then you wouldn't do that. You, would, you might be more likely to, uh, to motivate, to have motivated forgetting. All right, so another um, example of, of memory loss in long-term memory is called the retrieval failure. So let's see if you can answer this question now. Don't answer it out loud. Give people a chance to try to remember. Which part of the brain controls breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure? So just think about it for a minute. Breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. Okay, who knows the answer? What's the answer? The hypothalamus? No. If your notion was the medulla. The medulla. I hope it's true. 
The medulla, yes. The medulla controls breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. Okay? So it took our doctor over here to remember that. Uh, now, how about this one? What was the name of your first pet? What was the name of your first pet? What? Y'all gotta really speak up today. Yeah, let me take this cotton out of there. Go ahead. Lucky. Lucky? What else? Huh? Duke. Duke? Yeah, okay. Who else? Alright, is there anyone who doesn't remember the name of their first pet? Is there anyone in here who doesn't remember the name? Okay, so notice how much easier it is to remember stuff that is episodic. It's about us versus semantic, which is general knowledge. So the medulla was hard to remember because it's semantic, but the information about us is much easier to remember because it's episodic. So to know something right now, we have to retrieve it from long-term memory and bring it back to short-term. So you probably know the medulla, it's in there somewhere, but you couldn't bring it back up. <clears throat> so basically, retrieval failure happens when, when we lose the ability, we can't find what we're looking for in the big file that is our long-term memory, okay? And the more ways you put it in there, the more ways you try to learn something or memorize it or whatever, the more likely you are to find a pathway later that leads to that answer, okay? So, for example, I know this one by heart because this is my definition. It's a lot of people's definition, but it controls breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure, right? And so, for me, everywhere I go, it leads to medulla, okay? But for you guys, since you've only heard it once or twice or tried to remember it once or twice, then um, it's a lot harder to pick up on that file and go, oh, the answer is medulla. All right, so interference. Uh, so... This is like like uh, displacement, but it's a little different. So hopefully this will cap capture. This is my zoom um, on my camera. My zoom is me bringing it up. We gotta work with what we can, okay? All right, so there's two kinds of interference. The first one is called proactive interference. And the second one is called retroactive interference. So here's the first thing you learned. The first thing learned. And here's the second thing learned. All right, same here. First thing, second thing. All right. Now, what does retro mean? Huh? Past, back, okay? Retro means backwards, right? And pro is in progressive means what? Forward. Forward. Okay. So, in proactive interference, the interference happens this way, okay? This first thing you learn interferes with your ability to remember or even learn in the first place this second thing. So let's, let's say your biology instructor told you about the hippocampus's role in stress in, um, in the first week of class. And now, uh, way later in psychology, I tell you about the hippocampus's role in memory. What week are we on? Like maybe the 10th or something? I think so. The ninth. The ninth week? Okay. So that's the ninth week. So in this case, which would, would you forget? The first, the first week. Proactive goes this way. The first thing interferes so that you can't remember the second thing. Okay, so what you would forget here is what the psychology professor said. So here's a little, the arrow points to what you forget. You see what I mean? So in retro, the arrow is going to point backwards. So now you learn the first thing, what the biology instructor said, and then you learn the second thing, what I said. 
And now what I said is getting in the way and you're forgetting what the biology instructor says. So this is what we forget here and this is what we forget there. Okay? So the arrow points to what it is you're going to forget. You think first thing, second thing, right? So in proactive, you forget the first, the second thing, and in retroactive, you forget the first thing. Everybody with me? Okay. Zooming out. Don't you love technology? So advanced. Okay. So how can we improve long-term memory? There are many different things that we can do. First of all, long-term memory, things are in there by their meaning. So you want to organize your, your study by meaning. Whatever you need to, to remember, you need to do so by meaning. In other words, for example, I give you a certain uh, definition off the top of my head, and then it's, and sometimes I'll give you a different definition but certainly on the test, the definition will even be different, right? So what I'm saying with that is not that you have to uh, know these definitions heart, letter by letter, heart by heart, heart, two, what am I trying to say? By heart? Okay, whatever. What I'm saying is you need to know the gist, okay, of what it means. Like for example, uh, two girls are talking. Well, he said this, and then I said that, and then he said this, and he said that. Oh, my God. He said that? And what does she mean? She says, well, no, he didn't say that. But that's what he meant. So basically, you're not going to tell me about the, the conversation. I don't tell you, hey, I had this conversation with this guy, and it went like this, blah, 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 right? I tell you the gist of what we talked about. So he told me this, and I told him that, the meaning of it. That's how we put things in there. The second thing you need to do is overlearn. The first time you have something right, you don't stop. How many of you had to, to do the spelling test in school and every week you had a different a group of words to remember how to spell? Who did that? Okay, just check it. For a minute I thought like, it was just me. I hated spelling, it was by far my worst subject ever. And so I had all this list every Friday, big old stressor, because I had to know how to spell all these words, right? Well, <clears throat> when you're studying for something like that, you don't stop the first time you get them all right, right? You continue to practice, even though you got them right, until you can get them right over and over. That's over learning. All right, uh, recite or rewrite. Basically, this means don't reread. <clears throat> Rereading is what I call guilt-free procrastination, right? You're procrastinating. You're not really reading. I mean, excuse me, studying. You're not studying because studying requires trying to remember things. So you rewrite them or recite them, but don't reread because you're not really getting it. After you, you uh, study something, you should go to bed, go to sleep. That will uh, minimize interference. And I don't mean go play on your phone in bed. I mean go to sleep, okay? Uh, mnemonics. Mnemonics are memory assistance techniques that we can use to help us uh, remember something. So, for example, uh, you can, if you wanted to remember a grocery list, you could put your grocery items all in different places in the house. Uh, another mnemonic might be like, for the Great Lakes, remembering the, 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 the word homes. Um, also for the, for the musical notes, every good boy does fine, and so forth. So those are mnemonic techniques. It, uh, also using elaborate rehearsal is better than using rote rehearsal. Rote rehearsal just means repeating things or rewriting them over and over, uh, even out loud to yourself. But elaborate rehearsal means you're trying to connect something that, you, uh, that you're trying to remember to stuff you already know. So try to connect what you're trying to remember to stuff you already know. Like a little girl has to remember the planets for school. And she went to the um, planetarium, right? And she remembers, oh yeah, Saturn was the biggest or I saw the big red dot or whatever, okay? Um, 
Okay, so we're going to talk about more memory phenomena unless you have any questions at this point. This, this chapter, you can see why I spend so much time on some chapters and others are more self-explanatory, so we go pretty quickly. All right, so measuring memory and memory phenomena. Uh, how do we measure memory? So there's a couple of ways. Recall means that we test memory without any hint or clue. So you don't, a, a clue in the area of memory is called a cue, a cue, okay? And uh, basically this means that I don't give you any help and you have to remember the, uh, the answer. So if you spontaneously remember right now, you remember you have to go to the grocery store today, then that's recall. Uh, an example might be writing an essay where you have to remember all the points you want to make. Recognition is testing memory by giving some sort of hint or cue. Uh, so all you have to do is recognize the correct answer. So multiple choice, matching, even true false would be examples of recognition. Which one of those is easier? Recognition for sure, right? All right, and relearning is something that you don't need to know, but basically we, it's testing how long it takes you to relearn something after, it, after you had it and then you let it go for a while, okay? All right, now what are some memory phenomena? Uh, one of them is called the serial position effect. I don't have my list of words, um, but normally I have this list of words that I call out and I have you try to remember how many. And uh, one of the things you notice is that, it, try, try to remember them after I stop talking. So obviously it's short term memory, right? Because you're trying to keep it in your memory. So um, when you have this list of, of, of items in short term memory, the items at the beginning and at the end of the list we remember better than the things in the middle. So when I do that, I, I have all these words that have to do with sleep, but sleep is not one of the words. And so I noticed that the first three words or so, almost everybody remembers. And the last couple of words on the list, almost everybody remembers. But the stuff in the middle is much harder. So not only some of you will remember one of them and a different group will remember another and so forth. And uh, what I also noticed in this is that a lot of people will remember the word sleep. They thought they heard sleep, but they didn't because I didn't say it. All right, recency effect means that we remember the first few items and because, they, uh, sorry, the, the last items because they were more recent. And primacy effect means that we remember the first uh, few items we heard. So together they make up the serial position effect. All right, um, so other phenomena of memory, the environmental specificity hy hypothesis. This only works for recall, okay? And it means that you're, you're more likely to remember something when you're in the in same environment as when that happened or when you learned that. So if you're taking an essay test, you're better off studying in the same place that you're gonna take the test. Uh, when you go to the beach, you're more likely to remember other times when you were at the beach. State dependent learning means that uh, we often remember things better where, when we're in the same state of mind. And this also is true only for recall. So this, does, this wouldn't uh, you know, be you remembering something when somebody says, hey, remember this. It's you just uh, recalling it um, <clears throat> just out of the blue. So <clears throat> when we are in a certain state of mind, we're more likely to remember other times when we were in that state of mind. So for example, when you're down, you're more likely to remember times when you were down. Uh, if you're hyped up on caffeine, when you study for a test, you best get yourself some caffeine when you take a test, if that test is like an essay test, if it's a recall test. All right, the forgetting curve. So I'm gonna have to zoom in again to show you this. Let me get an eraser. All right, so this guy named Ebbinghaus 
did this study where he looked into, I guess I could do it over here. Nah, too much stuff. There's a close up of me, big time. Like my pores and stuff. Okay, so this guy named Ebby Haas did a, a study on himself, so a case study on himself. And what he was looking to see is how quickly do I forget stuff after I remember them, okay, after I learned them. Now remember learning is, occurs just the first time you have them all right, that's learning, right? But it can go on to also mean uh, what happens later. So um, in the forgetting curve, the first thing uh, that Ebbing Haas did was he made a list of, I believe it was 24 nonsense syllables. A nonsense syllables is a consonant, uh, consonant, vowel, consonant combination that doesn't spell anything. So not cat or dog or run or cup, right? Some a, a consonant and a consonant with a vowel in between, but they mean nothing, okay? I don't know, like V, O, uh, F, okay? Something like that. So the first, this is the percentage that he recalled. And here we have 100%. The immediate recall, the first time that he got them all right, he got 100%. Now he stopped there. He didn't overlearn them, okay? He stopped. And let's say this is 50% and 60% and 40%. After 20 minutes, he's gone down almost to, uh, he's lost about 40%. So this is after 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, he's lost a great deal of information, almost 40% of it. And then one hour later, it goes down to about 60% loss, so he only remembers 40 of them. And what happens to the curve after that is this. So this is nine hours, and then he has uh, 24 hours. So this is one day, and this is 30 days. And you remember, you see that what he remembers, especially like here, this is, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many days, but the five, seven days or something. But you can see that the, the learning levels off. And what he remembers that from day one to day six or seven is basically the same thing he remembers from then on. It's a small percentage, it's about 30, 20%, okay? So this is pretty depressing, right? You're gonna learn something and it's gonna take, it's gonna go downhill immediately. Well, here's why what you learn is not gonna go downhill so fast. First of all, you're gonna overlearn. So these are the things he didn't do that you would do differently so that you don't get this huge drop in the amount of information, okay? Also, he didn't, he used nonsense syllables. So you wanna try to remember stuff by its meaning. Try to remember, make things meaningful. Okay? If you make things meaningful, it will stick with you. For example, if the co consonant vowel consonant that he remembered were uh, bed, cat, cup, tea, run, okay, then he might think, uh, he might ma make a picture in his mind, whether he's trying to or not, that he comes in from a run and his cat is laying on his bed and he goes and makes himself a cup of tea. You see what I mean? So that just all fits and he would remember that for much longer than if, if you're looking at meaningless things like VOF, whatever that is, right? It's nothing. You got it? So overlearn and things are meaningful. That will help a lot in overcoming that forgetting curve.
Why is memory said to be reconstructive? Like I said, okay, um, when, I, when I use that list of words, which I can't believe I forgot, um, most people think they heard sleep. Sleep is not on the list, but all the words have to do with sleep, like comfort, night, pillow, stuff like that. And so what happens is that people remember a word that isn't there, which tells us that memory is part truth and part fiction, okay? So our memories are not exact. We remember the highlights of things and then we add on fiction based on our opinions, our prejudices, and, uh, and the things we expect that should have happened. So memory is part truth and part fiction. Memory is also very selective. We remember things that we created and that pertain to us much better than things that do not pertain to us or that we did not uh, create. And also we remember things that support our opinion more so than things that don't. So if something supports your opinion, uh, you are gonna remember it better than facts that, that go against your opinion. So our review diagram, I'm going to go back to the first one. All right, so here's sensory memory. All sensory input goes into sensory memory. It lasts a, a split second. It, the capacity, however, is large because it's in, we see that image in great detail or hear that in great detail. If it's not transferred to short-term memory, meaning if we don't pay attention to it, it will decay after uh, two seconds at most, and or it will get displaced because something else will come into our sensory uh, input. And then anything we pay attention to goes into short-term memory, where it lasts 20 or 30 seconds. It has uh, about five, about seven pieces of information that fit in there. We can make it last longer by rehearsing it. We can um, make more stuff fit in there through chunking. So we increase the duration through rehearsal, we increase the capacity through chunking. The information can decay or, or be displaced. Uh, sometimes it's encoded into long-term memory where the, uh, the duration is unlimited and the capacity is also unlimited. And in order to know something right now, we have to take it from long-term memory and retrieve it back into short-term memory. Remember, this is also called working memory. Whatever we're working on is in short-term memory. If we, uh, if we have memory loss in long-term memory, it can happen to, due to a consolidation failure, meaning we physically don't make a memory because we fainted or something like that. Uh, due to an encoding failure, we saw something, we read about it, whatever, but we didn't try to remember it. Motivated forgetting, we have some psychological reason or motive for forgetting. A retrieval failure, where it's in the long-term memory but you can't access it, you can't get to it, can't find the right neural pathways to bring it back to short term and also through interference okay when one thing gets in the way of you remembering the other how are we doing okay all right now